This is a Dynamic Network podcast. Hey everyone, Marvelous Joe here at the top of the episode. With the approaching holiday season, we're officially kicking off this year's holiday charity drive in lead up to our charity duel episode in December, which is going to be Alfred Pennyworth versus Edwin Jarvis. This year, all donations will be going once again to Pop Culture Classroom, a nonprofit organization that delivers high quality, all inclusive educational resources to school districts, teachers, and community organizations using comics, graphic novels, and related pop culture media. Their mission is to inspire a love of learning, increase literacy, celebrate diversity, and build community through the tools of pop culture and the power of self expression. To donate to this wonderful charity, visit our official store through dynamicduel.com where you'll find two donation options, one if you're Team DC and one if you're Team Marvel. Or you can go directly to dynamicduel.com slash donate DC, one word, or dynamicduel.com slash donate Marvel, which are linked in our show notes. We're making the charity drive a competitive duel this year, except that the only stat is which side can donate the most. Everyone who donates will receive a digital poster featuring original art of Alfred and Jarvis that's inspired by New Yorker cartoons. One lucky random donor will win a framed print of the Alfred vs. Jarvis art that we'll announce during that December duel episode. Which fan base will be the most charitable? We'll keep everyone posted as to which team is winning as donations come in during these upcoming episodes. Thanks to everyone who donates, and on with the show! Welcome to the Dynamic Duel Podcast, a weekly show where we review superhero films and debate the superiority between Marvel and DC by comparing their characters in stat-based battle simulations. I'm Johnny DC. And I'm his twin brother, Marvelous Joe. And in this episode, we are going to pit the DC villain of Mongol against the Marvel villain, Annihilus. They're both intergalactic tyrants, and we thought it would be a good matchup in lead up to our review of the Marvels. Right, yeah, Captain Marvel is a cosmic level hero, so we're doing a duel with cosmic level bad guys. Both of these characters are pretty interesting, so I can't wait to tell you all about them later on in this episode. Before that, we're going to break down the comic book movie news from the past week, of which there was one major news item, and that was the first Echo official trailer for the upcoming Disney Plus series. As always, we list our segment times in our episode description, so feel free to check out the show notes if you want to skip ahead to a particular topic. As our listeners may know, our dual simulator is so advanced that it's gained sentience and has named itself the artificial life form for running extensive duels, just a rather very intelligent simulator 9000 or Alfred Jarvis 9000. He has a quick message for our listeners, so listen up. Why, hello there. Do you love listening and chatting about Marvel and DC? Then become a part of the Dynamic Duel community on Patreon, where you can choose from three tiers. The Dynamic 2.0 tier lets you listen to this podcast without ads and gives you access to its Discord chat group where you can chat with Johnny DC and Marvelous Joe. The Fantastic 4 tier gives you that and more with two bonus episodes each month, including bloopers and top 10 shows where Johnny and Joe count down your favorite Marvel and DC subjects. The X-Force tier makes you an executive producer of Dynamic Duel, where every month you help the host choose what to review and who to fight against each other. And finally, the Dynamite Podcast Network tier allows aspiring podcasters to create their own battle-focused show using this Monte Carlo simulator. Johnny and Joe will help you develop your show, provide graphic support and consultation, and get you simulation results to announce on your show. Pitch the twins your show via email at dynamicduelpodcast at gmail.com or by reaching out to them on social media. Check it out at patreon.com slash dynamicduel. Pip pip cheerio. Thanks, AJ9K, and thanks to everyone who supports the podcast. Be sure, guys, to tune into the Max Destruction podcast this week, which is part of the Dynamite Podcast Network, where hosts Ken and Dustin are going to pit Roger Murtaugh from the Lethal Weapon franchise against John McClane from Die Hard. That'll be a good one. Also tune into the Sinjo World podcast this Thursday to find out who would win in an anime battle between Hashirama Senju from Naruto and William Vengeance 
from Black Clover. Visit dynamicpodcasts.com or click in the link in our show notes to listen to all of the shows in the Dynamite Podcast Network. But with that out of the way, quick to the no prize. A no prize is an award Marvel used to give out to fans. Our version, the Dynamic Dual No Prize, is a digital award we post on Instagram and in our email newsletter for the person that we feel gave the best answer to our question of the week. For last week, we asked, what was your favorite Netflix Marvel television series and why? And this was coming off the news that the Daredevil Born Again series has got a showrunner in Dario Scardapane, who was a writer on the Punisher Netflix series. Yeah, it was pretty exciting news. We got quite a few answers, so we'll break down all of the honorable mentions before revealing this week's no prize winner. Our first honorable mention goes to Travis Herndon, who said, Hey guys, Travis here. So my pick would have to be The Defenders. I think that show was a pretty good series. It was sort of a kind of Avengers light, having all the street level heroes team up together to fight a common foe. Oh, it makes me really hope that maybe we might get another season or maybe bring the Defenders into the main MCU. So my pick would definitely be Defenders. Yeah, great answer, Travis. I actually really like the Defenders. For some reason, it gets a lot of shit from a lot of people, I think, because Iron Fist wasn't that smart in the series. And there were some plot elements like with the the dragons underneath New York City and stuff that were kind of stupid. But I really love the interactions between all four of the Defenders characters, including Daredevil, Jessica Jones, Luke Cage, and Iron Fist. It was the best part of the show. And it kind of felt the most comic booky out of all of the Marvel Netflix series. So I can totally see why this could be somebody's favorite. I mean, for me, the Defenders was my second least favorite Netflix Marvel series, mostly because I think it had a villain problem. But I can't deny the fact that it was cool to see all the characters from these other shows that we were watching come together, just like the Avengers movie. You know, it had that same appeal. For sure. Yeah. I hope the Disney Plus series carries forward the Defenders concept in some way, shape or form for that platform. Yeah, it'd be really cool if they brought back the actors for Luke Cage and Jessica Jones specifically. And the Punisher. And Elektra. (laughs) Just fucking everybody but Iron Fist. Our next honorable mention goes to... Anson Millard, who said, Hey, it's Anson Millard. My favorite Marvel Netflix show was Luke Cage. I feel like that is the underdog pick for this. So Luke Cage, I feel like, had the best action scenes from the standpoint of just having one overpowered guy go against entire mobs of people. I also love the music in there. Bulletproof Love was awesome. It's cool that Method Man showed up. And... Just great villains. Great show. Oh, for sure. There was a lot to love about the Luke Cage television series, especially season two, which I was a big fan of. But Luke Cage brought so many unique things to the table, including the music. The action was really awesome, although you kind of wonder why bad guys even bother to bring guns to their fights anymore, you know. (laughs) Uh, And for like the Iron Fist series, you wondered why nobody brought guns to those fights. They were all martial artists. But yeah, it was a great series, and Mike Coulter was just phenomenal in the role. It is an absolute tragedy that that story was not able to continue into a season three. Like, I'm still dying to learn what happened afterward. Right, yeah, that was a great cliffhanger ending for season two. It was so Godfather! It was so good! (laughs) Our next honorable mention goes to Lizzie Dyer Arney, who said, Hey, it's Lizzie. 100% I have to say my favorite Marvel Netflix show was Daredevil. Uh, Seasons one and three were definitely pure perfection. Season two wasn't as good with the uh, Defenders crossover. I didn't like that. But I I mean, you have Matt Murdock. He's a blind lawyer. He's got elevated super senses and he's defending Hell's Kitchen. You got Marcy, Foggy, Karen. They're the best side characters you can ask for. If they're not in the new Disney version, I'm really not interested. Yeah, this is kind of the obvious answer, right? The common answer. At least two other people gave the answer of Daredevil because it was phenomenal. And hopefully Disney Plus can carry forward that greatness as much as they can with their upcoming Born Again series. It sounds like Disney is trying to recapture some of that previous magic. Except, of course, when it comes to the supporting cast, right? Because Karen and Foggy are not returning. And that's really a shame because a big part of, you know, any superhero is his supporting cast for them to not be in the upcoming Born Again series is really a shame, especially since the series seemed at least to have been going heavily down the road of a courtroom drama. And for 
Matt to not have his firm partner there with him in Foggy Nelson is kind of a shame. Well, I heard the whole reason they're not going with those actors specifically was because if they did, they would need to pay the old Netflix Daredevil show writers like some sort of creative residuals, and they don't want to do that. That's super lame. They're Disney. They have all the money in the world. They should do it. I just think they really hate Netflix. <laughs> but no, great answer, Lizzie. Nate Mantineo and Abner O'Terry were the two others who gave the answer of Daredevil as well. So thanks to everyone who took the time to visit our website and record an answer. But the winner of this week's no prize is Brayden Johnston, who said, Hey, Brayden Jay here. New to the podcast, and I've been loving every second of it, but I'd say my favorite Marvel Netflix series would have to be The Punisher. I discovered it a few years ago, right after I had my daughter, and so Frank's story really kind of hit home with me there. And especially getting into season two, that's where, you know, everything got amplified for me. Just the story, the emotional beats, the action, and everything just got way better after that. I do feel that since the Punisher Netflix series came out later than the other shows, like after the Defenders aired and everything like that, the Punisher was often overlooked, I think, both seasons. But I think that's really a shame because both seasons were really well done. I think John Bernthal was an incredible Punisher, and it's nice to see that there are people out there that appreciate the show as much as I do. It brought so much nuance to the character of Frank Castle that I think a lot of other adaptations, they kind of wrote him off as like this really one note character. But to really explore the depth of the Punisher is to make him so much more interesting. And I think that was the true strength of the Punisher Netflix television series. Absolutely. Yeah, I loved this series both seasons. I don't know if we're going to get another Punisher series for Disney Plus like we're doing for Daredevil, but the Punisher was supposed to appear in the Daredevil Born Again series, and we'll see if the creative reboot changes that. I hope it doesn't. Yeah, that would be a shame if we lost the chance to see John Bernthal in the role again. But great answer, Brayden Johnston. You're the winner of this week's No Prize. If you, the listener, want a shot at winning your own No Prize, stay tuned to later on this episode when we'll be asking another question of the week. And now that that's done, on to the news! This past week, we got the first official trailer for the Echo television series that's going to come out on Disney+. Plus Later on next year, we thought maybe... The show is going to come out in November of this year, but it's actually coming out January 10th on Disney Plus and on Hulu. The overall tone of the trailer surprised me. I don't know what I was expecting. Honestly, I was not expecting much from this Echo Television series, but the best thing that I could say about it is that it really seems to be carrying forward the vibe that was set in the Daredevil Netflix series. I was really impressed with what we saw here. I'm really hoping that the trailer doesn't end up better than the show itself, but at the very least, the trailer got me hyped, which is, you know, what it's supposed to do. I was also shocked by this trailer. Like, this show went from the bottom of my list to what I'm interested in watching to, like, the top for Marvel. Yeah, I mean, like, because Echo wasn't all that compelling in the Hawkeye television series, right? Right. But to really explore her past with the Kingpin, and, you know, honestly, just to have the Kingpin back, Vincent D'Onofrio's portrayal of the character is so freaking impactful. Literally, you see him just, like, pounding this dude into the dumpster, into the pavement in this trailer. It, It really seems to be setting a new tone for what we get from Marvel Studios and the maturity level, and, of course, again, the tone. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've been knocking the Kingpin as part of the MCU ever since we saw him in Hawkeye because I thought Disney really screwed the character over. But this trailer makes up for all of that. I recant my blasphemy. (laughs) He is amazing as the character. Yeah, well, in Hawkeye, he was a little bit cartoony, right? Right. Um, But that was just kind of the vibe of the show. But here, the vibe is much more in keeping with the character as we know him from previous seasons. And regarding the whole vibe, it seems like Marvel is introducing a new brand for these type of like character-driven, grounded stories. That's going to be called Marvel Spotlight, which was the name of a comic book title that Marvel used to produce to introduce new characters or put a spotlight on lesser-known characters within the comics. Yeah, this will be Marvel Studios' first like sub-banner, which is interesting, that it would debut with something like Echo. 
Right. We've seen Marvel have a sub banner before when it comes to film productions, like with Punisher Warzone and Ghost Rider Spirit of Vengeance. Those were under the Marvel Knights banner, but that was abandoned. Usually those productions were other studios. But now that Marvel owns everything except for, you know, Spider-Man, they've created their own sub brand in Marvel Spotlight, which I think is pretty interesting. I don't know if it's entirely necessary. Do you think it means that Echo is not in the MCU? No, I, I, I just think people don't have to worry about whether it is going to be or not. OK, yeah, that makes sense. Like, it's not going to connect to any larger story. It's just an interesting standalone story. At the very least, I think it'll keep this trend that we have among fans to try to like spot Easter eggs and connections to the larger, you know, saga that's going on currently, the multiversal saga or other television shows and stuff like that. I think it just allows fans to just focus on the story as kind of a standalone thing as opposed to dissecting it to death. And thank goodness, because I got really tired of all that. Oh, look, Mephisto confirmed shit. (laughs) Yeah, a break from that kind of over analysis is something that I think would extremely benefit the MCU as a whole. But regarding the trailer, you know, it starts off with young Echo, Maya Maya Lopez, um, trying to order an ice cream from an ice cream cart, and the vendor is being a dick to her because she's not able to speak given that she's deaf. For his slight against this little girl, Kingpin beats the shit out of him, maybe to death, I don't know. But we know that in the comics and in the MCU continuity, Kingpin basically raises this little girl as if she were his own, And he loves her. You know, he sees a lot of himself in Maya. I really love the effect they gave for all of the impacts throughout this entire trailer of, like, echoes. Like, when the kingpin hits the the guy selling the ice cream, the sound of his punch repeats itself. Right, yeah, and it actually transforms during the course of the trailer into more of a Native American chant toward the end. I don't know if you caught that, but that was pretty interesting. One of the things I learned about the show is that Echo is not going to have the traditional powers that she has from the comics in this show. So if you listen to our question versus Echo episode that we've done on this podcast, you learn all about the backstory of Echo and what her actual powers are, which are kind of like Taskmaster. She's able to view a physical action and then recreate it through her experienced physical training. Now, do you think that's because of Taskmaster? And how we've already seen her in the MCU in the Black Widow movie? Yeah, I think it's possible that since Echo and Taskmaster have almost the same powers, that the MCU would want to differentiate that. I guess the abilities that Echo is going to have in this show derive from her Native American heritage, specifically the Choctaw tribe. I think I'm pronouncing that right. And she basically calls upon the spirits of her ancestors which give her certain abilities, which is interesting. I I don't know. I, I understand why they may be changing her powers. Honestly, I don't love that. I'm kind of okay with Taskmaster and Echo having similar abilities. There is a tendency, though, I find for ethnically diverse characters to draw their powers from their heritage, which I don't think is always necessary. I think that's overdone. I think it's far more interesting for them to just have powers and not go too overboard. Because honestly, okay, so I'm all for inclusion. I'm the biggest proponent of diversity in comics and television shows and film, but transforming Echo's powers to be more cultural like this is almost like changing Daredevil's radar sense to be like the sight of God or something because he's Catholic, right? You don't always have to tie in the powers into the character's identity. Sometimes it's better just for the characters to have identity and then deal with their own powers. Like Blue Beetle, look at Blue Beetle. You know, his Kajida Scarab actually has nothing to do with his Mexican heritage. But he's still a fascinating character. Look at a character like Wolverine, or a lot of the X-Men actually, like Storm, Banshee, all of these characters that are not so boxed in with their abilities. Yeah, I mean, I agree with what you've said, but I also don't mind the Native American heritage thing. As long as it's something I've never seen before, I think I'm interested. If she did have the same powers as Taskmaster, I'd be like, oh, redundant character, you know, and I don't want Echo to be a redundant character. (laughs) That's a great point. I mean, you are also coming from the perspective of someone who's not really an Echo fan or read any of the Echo comics. Exactly. So you probably don't give a shit if they change her too drastically like that. But all that being said, you're right. If they do it well enough, it could be fascinating and it could be really cool to see and a great way to include Native American cultural aspects. Right. Yeah. And I'm not sure about what all of her different powers are going to be, but it does look like she has the power to kick ass, which is all I need from the show, really. 
It was like way more hardcore than I thought it was going to be. Oh, it looks super violent. Yeah, you see people getting straight up shot in the face in this trailer, uh, which Damn. I was not expecting. No. One thing I, w- I wanted to touch on, though, is that they did reveal what Echo's superhero costume looks like online. Oh, I did not see that. Yeah, they revealed it at a Q&A session that they did at the Choctaw Nation's annual powwow event where they screened the first two episodes of the show. It, it looks very much like, you know, traditional Native American garb updated for a modern era, kind of like what they did with traditional African garb in the Black Panther movie, how it was brought into the modern era. It looks pretty cool. Oh, interesting. Uh, honestly, I would have just settled for the white palm on the face, but yeah, this works too. It, it's a little bit more colorful than I thought it would be, especially given that the character of Echo's costume in the comics is mostly black and white, you know? Right. We got the ever so slightest, briefest of shots of Daredevil in this trailer. It was kind of like a blink and you'll miss it type thing, but it looked incredible. He's like diving across this room or something like that. And yeah, it looks fantastic. I can't wait to see Daredevil in the show. But more importantly than that, I love that they didn't make that Daredevil cameo the highlight of this trailer. They kept the focus on the relationship between Echo and Kingpin. And I think that's where it needs to stay. I did blink and miss it because I had no idea Daredevil was in the trailer. Is he wearing his yellow suit or his red suit? It's like black. It's really dark in the room. It's hard to tell. Huh? Well, it looks like I'm going to have to frame by frame this shit now. Oh, yeah, look at that. Eh. What do you mean, eh? Eh. Piece of shit. You know it's fucking awesome. I'll need to see more. I can't wait to see more. Yeah, and we'll see more on January 10th. It's only five episodes. They're all dropping at once, so we'll be reviewing the show the following Tuesday. But speaking of the Echo series and the Marvel Spotlight banner, that brings us to our question of the week. Which not currently existing MCU character would you like to see get their own miniseries under the Marvel Spotlight banner, and why? Yeah, and again, this has to be specifically a character that we have not seen under a Marvel Studios film or television series. Yeah, and we'll include the Netflix characters in that too, so none of the Defenders or Punisher. Record your answer at dynamicduel.com by clicking on the red microphone button in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen, which will prompt you to leave us a voicemail. Your message could be up to 30 seconds long, and don't forget to leave your name in case we include you on the podcast. We'll pick our favorite answer and award that person a Dynamic Duel No Prize that we'll post to Instagram and our email newsletter. Be sure to answer before November 11th. But I think that does it for all the news for this episode. Now let's move on to the main event, where we find out who will win in a matchup between the villain characters of Mongol and Annihilus. Okay, Mongol versus Annihilus. Uh, As we mentioned earlier in the episode, both of these characters are tyrannical intergalactic villains. Muggle is primarily a Superman and Green Lantern villain, although he's gone up against other superheroes before. Annihilus, if I'm not mistaken, is primarily a Fantastic Four villain. Correct. Yes, although he's posed quite the thorn in the side of all of Marvel's cosmic level heroes, including the Guardians of the Galaxy, Silver Surfer, Nova, and whatnot. Right, I don't know much about him other than that he's pretty powerful, so I'm actually looking forward to learning more about him. Really? Well, I'm not looking forward to learning about Mongol because he's DC and I don't give a shit. Well, that's your fucking mistake because Mongol's dope. He's really cool. <laughs> You'll see. I, I mean, he wasn't that dope in the recent War World movie, the animated one. He was kind of uh, that's lame. Fair. Yeah, yeah. That's, he was actually really lame. He was done much better in the Justice League cartoon. And uh, at least he's fucking been on the screen. We have yet to see anything about Annihilus. Pretty sure. Annihilus has been in a cartoon. I'm fairly certain. Well, it was shitty then because no one knows about it. (laughs) To explain the methodology behind her duels, let's go to our sentient duel simulator, Alfred Jarvis 9000. AJ9K, tell our listeners how you go about determining a winner in our duel matchups. Yes, of course, sir. The way I determine a winner between the contestants is by running 1,000 Monte Carlo simulations using the character's statistics. A Monte Carlo simulation is a probabilistic model used to determine outcomes through random sampling. 
In this case, I randomized the statistics along a normal distribution as a way to simulate the many variables that can occur during battle. The stat parameters are based on the official Marvel power grid from which the DC character's statistics are extrapolated. Additional stat categories are included such as range, damage potential, versatility and perception in order to create a more detailed and accurate simulation. The results of the 1000 simulations provide a percentage of wins for each character. The contestant with the higher percentage is declared the victor as they have a higher probability to win any given battle. In an equitable pairing, neither character should win 100% of the matches. The comic book stories have shown that there's even a way for Batman to defeat Superman, so the confidence rate of my method falls in line with the precedents that have been established in the source material. My mathematical simulations are without subjectivity or bias. Feats are not the sole consideration, nor are fan votes tabulated for determination of the winner. Thanks, AJ9K. Before we run the simulations, though, we like to break down each character's histories and abilities before improvising a scenario on how we imagine one of the 1000 simulations would play out beat for beat. And I believe it's my turn to go first with the Marvel character, so let me go ahead and tell you all about Annihilus. Many millennia ago, in the antimatter universe known as the Negative Zone, a technologically advanced species known as the Tyannans traveled throughout the dimension, seeding life spores across barren planets. A freak meteor collision forced one of the Tyannan spore ships to crash onto a planet called Arthros, where the crew died. One of those spores evolved prematurely into a small insectoid creature. Remarkably intelligent, the creature struggled to survive, becoming convinced that everything wanted to kill it and that it must kill to survive. Eventually, the creature discovered the Tyannan starship and learned how to use their advanced technology. Over time, the creature grew in size and strength, intent on eradicating any threat to its existence. From the starship's warp drive, the insectoid built the perfect weapon, the cosmic control rod, and from the remaining life spores developed an army of other insectoid creatures called the Scavengers. He developed armor for himself, becoming a paranoid despot known as Annihilus, ravaging neighboring planets just to protect himself from the potential danger they could pose to him. For Annihilus feared only one thing, death. After developing a reputation as one of the Negative Zone's most fearsome and powerful warlords, Annihilus encountered the Fantastic Four for the first time. The superhero team had traveled into the Negative Zone when Mr. Fantastic detected the Cosmic Control Rod as a source of anti-particles, which they needed to treat Invisible Woman who was having cosmic ray-related complications with her pregnancy at the time. The team stole Annihilus' weapon and escaped his wrath, though they returned it after using it to go back home in the Positive Matter universe. You can learn more about the Fantastic Four in their dual episode against the Justice Society. After conquering much of the Negative Zone, Annihilus set his sights on the Microverse and tried to invade Subatomica. Though he was successful, he and his army were eventually repelled. Annihilus briefly teamed up with Mr. Fantastic when the hero was trapped in the Negative Zone to stop another villain called the Mad Thinker from taking over both positive and negative dimensions. After Annihilus formed a truce with fellow Negative Zone warlord Blastar, he showed his new ally his newest and greatest addition to his scavenger army, a robot created by AIM called the Super Adaptoid. Suspicious of Annihilus' plans, Blastar's wife sent out a distress signal to the Avengers who came and defeated Annihilus, Blastar, and the Super Adaptoid. For her actions, Annihilus killed Blastar's wife, and Blastar in turn stole the cosmic control rod. Without his weapon of choice, Annihilus snuck onto Earth and took Mr. Fantastic and Invisible Woman's son, Franklin, hostage, forcing the Fantastic Four to go into the Negative Zone and confront Blastar to get it back. Though Annihilus planned for his army to invade Earth's dimension through a portal in the Fantastic Four's New York City headquarters known as the Baxter Building, the Fantastic Four, alongside the Avengers, were able to stop Annihilus. Later, he tried to invade the realm of Asgard when it temporarily drifted into the Negative Zone at a time when its Bifrost Rainbow Bridge was shattered. Annihilus was able to defeat every Asgardian warrior, including Thor, but was ultimately defeated by Odin. Unable to accept his defeat, Annihilus kidnapped Odin in his sleep 
and then lost in a second battle with Thor, who then returned Odin back to Asgard, which was now gone from the negative zone. Eventually, Annihilus discovered his old creators, the once thought lost to time Tyannans, though they were under the control of another villain known as Brute. Teaming up with Mr. Fantastic, Annihilus defeated the Brute and freed the Tyannans, though Mr. Fantastic created a force field around their home planet to protect the species from Annihilus trying to conquer them. When a corporation called the Gideon Trust breached the negative zone to mine its resources, they also stole Annihilus' cosmic control rod. During his efforts to get his weapon back, the rod was shattered, and Annihilus was finally killed. However, upon his death, his body released a pod containing insectoid larva that was cloned from Annihilus as part of his failsafe plan for death. The larva grew, possessing all of Annihilus' memories and intelligence. However, it was later discovered that multiple cloned larva had spawned from the pod, forcing one of the Annihilus clones to kill the rest. This surviving Annihilus rebuilt the cosmic control rod and discovered a powerful energy source known as the Opposing Force, which was the negative zone equivalent to the Power Cosmic, which is wielded by Silver Surfer and Galactus, both of whom you can learn more about in their respective dual episodes. After learning that the positive matter universe was expanding into the antimatter negative zone, Annihilus felt that the positive matter universe was now part of his domain. Using the Opposing Force, he led his massive insect scavenger armada through the energy surge that separated the two universes, and he led a full assault across the cosmos that was called the Annihilation Wave. Annihilus' armies devastated whole galaxies and an untold number of worlds. He killed a multitude of cosmic heroes, captured Galactus and all power cosmic wielding heroes, and laid waste to entire alien empires and species. It took the combined alliance of nearly every living hero outside of Earth to eventually stop Annihilus and his wave, but when Nova finally ripped Annihilus' organs from out of his throat, Annihilus was merely reborn on a Kree planet that was ceded to his invasion, and he grew to his former self back in the negative zone. Annihilus later killed the Human Torch after the hero sacrificed himself to keep the Warlord from invading the positive matter universe from a portal in the Baxter building. The Human Torch was kept alive though using healing worms that stitched together his body so that Annihilus might get him to reopen the portal. But the hero stole the cosmic control rod and escaped the negative zone back to Earth. Despite no longer wielding his weapon, Annihilus proved to be enough of a threat from his devastating prior invasion to earn himself a seat on the Galactic Council as a representative of the negative zone, eventually getting his rod back after a fight with the Fantastic Four. Later, Annihilus studied the Hulk and learned the secret of his gamma transformation from Bruce Banner. He used this knowledge to grow into a massive giant, from there absorbing his entire dimension, becoming an all-powerful entity in the negative zone. It took the combined efforts of the Guardians of the Galaxy, Thanos, and the Shi'ar Imperial Guard to stop him, where Adam Warlock devolved Annihilus into a small bug and Thanos stomped on him. You can learn more about the Guardians and Thanos in their respective dual episodes. Again, Annihilus was reborn in the negative zone where he currently remains, having recently gained a foothold in the positive matter universe by invading a planet called Praxis 2 and transforming it into Annihilation World, which was a new bridge into the negative zone. That's his backstory. Powers-wise, Annihilus is an evolved insectivorid with enhanced physical abilities, including increased strength, able to lift 50 tons, increased speed with flight, and an indestructible exoskeleton that can withstand even a Nova Flame. He's virtually immortal as his cosmic control rod halts his aging, and he has a failsafe for death involving resurrection via cloned larva. His cosmic control rod can also fire massive amounts of incredibly destructive energy, up to 10 megatons. It can manipulate matter using the opposing force and create portals within and to and from the negative zone to travel through or summon his scavengers or other creatures. He's a gifted engineer and scientist, though Annihilus' strategic thinking usually incorporates some form of overwhelming force. His one weakness is his mouth as it's a way to get past his exoskeleton into his more vulnerable interior. And that's Nihilus. I mean, I guess that's an interesting backstory. I don't think it's as interesting as Mongols, I have to say. But, uh, you know, it's, it's good enough for Marvel. He's basically as powerful as like a Herald of Galactus, but instead of wielding the power of Cosmic, 
you know, he wields the opposing force. Right. Yeah, it definitely seems like a powerful dude. But I, I think Mongol's got him in this matchup. Let me tell you all about Mongol. Little is known about the early life of Mongol, other than he's the disgraced ruler and former tyrant of an unknown planet of billions until an ancient priest named Archimandite led a revolt that overthrew Mongol's reign. Stripped of his power, Mongol scoured the universe for a source of power that granted him the strength to never lose power again. Eventually, Mongol learned of an artifact known as the Crystal Key that could activate a planetary weapon known as War World. The key was located in a vault on the fourth planet of the Cygnus star system, which was stored there by Martian Manhunter at the behest of a deceased race of peaceful aliens known as the Largus. After failing to defeat Martian Manhunter to get the key, Mongol learned of Superman, and he kidnapped Lois Lane, Jimmy Olsen, and Daily Planet reporter Steve Lombardi in order to force Superman to fight Martian Manhunter and get the key for him, which Superman did. You can learn more about Superman in our Superman vs. Doctor Doom episode. After Martian Manhunter rescued Superman's friends, he and Superman fought Mongol together, though Mongol was able to teleport himself and his ship away as soon as he got his hands on the key. After Mongol successfully activated Warworld, the psychic link he now had over the planet overwhelmed him when he attempted to destroy Superman, and Mongol was forced to flee the battle. Later, Mongol was able to defeat Starman on the planet Throne World, a world capable of destroying other planets, and took control of its superweapon. Superman intervened by rescuing Starman, however, and Mongol was once again forced to retreat. Desperate for revenge against Superman, Mongol infected the hero with a parasitic psychic plant known as Black Mercy on Superman's birthday that placed Superman in a paralyzed dream state where he dreamt that he had grown up on the planet Krypton, which had never exploded. Superman's mind rejected the illusion, however, and he broke free of the Black Mercy before Mongol himself became infected and trapped in a never-ending dream of universal conquest. After the Crisis on Infinite Earth storyline merged DC's multiverse and created a new continuity, Mongol was once again in control of Warworld, with which he conquered and enslaved entire star systems. To distract and control the denizens of his empire, Mongol hosted gladiatorial games on Warworld that were fought by the strongest among those he had enslaved. During a time when Superman had exiled himself from Earth after killing Zod, he was captured by Warworld and Mongol forced Superman to compete in the arena. Superman rose amongst the gladiatorial ranks to Mongol's disdain, and Mongol arranged a battle between the hero and Warworld's fiercest warrior, an alien known as Draga. When Superman defeated Draga, but refused to kill him, challenging Mongol in rebellion instead, an enraged Mongol attacked and nearly killed Superman before the hero was teleported away by an alien cleric with ties to Krypton that had been watching the battle. Superman's act of defiance spurred a rebellion on Warworld, and Drago was able to defeat Mongol and take control of the giant weapon after removing Mongol's crystal amulet that he wore on his chest. Swearing revenge and stealing a city-sized space cruiser, Mongol fled Warworld, which was later taken over by the villain Brainiac, who you can learn more about in our Brainiac vs. Ultron episode. Mongol ended up on a small planet known as Periton 5, which he was able to conquer easily due to its technological inferiority. Mongol Starcraft, however, became infected by the mind of Hank Henshaw, who would later become Cyborg Superman, and who managed to overpower Mongol as his ship was the most advanced technology accessible on the planet. After Superman's death at the hands of Doomsday, Mongol traveled to Earth under Cyborg Superman's orders and used his Starcraft to destroy Coast City, the home of the Green Lantern, Hal Jordan, who you can learn more about in our Green Lantern vs. Nova episode. In place of Coast City, Mongol quickly constructed a massive engine, which he named Engine City, and gave it to Cyborg Superman, who had framed another Superman imposter known as the Eradicator for Coast City's destruction. With plans to betray Cyborg Superman and destroy Metropolis in an effort to create a second engine as part of an overall plot to turn Earth into a new war world, Mongol's plans were foiled by the real Superman, who by this point had returned from the dead. Though Mongol nearly succeeded in killing Superman as Engine City was powered by kryptonite gas, a rage-fueled Green Lantern overpowered Mongol, who was imprisoned on Earth. After escaping prison multiple times, Mongol was transferred to a satellite prison orbiting the moon, 
where he was forced to undergo experimental mental reconditioning to pacify him. Mongol fooled the scientists there into believing that their methods were working, and when opportunity struck, Mongol slaughtered everyone on board and fled the solar system in a spacecraft. Though he nearly died adrift in space after his ship was randomly attacked, he was rescued by the peaceful citizens of the planet Debstem IV, which he quickly conquered. Unwilling to be ruled over and succumbing to a fatal disease that Mongol had unknowingly brought to the planet, the citizens of Debstem IV sabotaged all spacecrafts and committed suicide, trapping Mongol on the planet with no one to rule over save for two children, a son and daughter that he had fathered that were immune to the disease. Mongol was eventually teleported to Earth by the demon Neuron, who made an example of Mongol by killing him in front of Earth's other villains. Mongol's son, known as Mongol II, grew rapidly and studied his father's legacy. After several battles with the Justice League, Mongol and his sister Mongal were teleported to their home planet, where Mongol killed his sister. During the Blackest Night event, Mongol II's father returned as a Black Lantern and killed all of the slaves that his son had acquired. Escaping his father, Mongol II acquired Yellow Lantern rings by killing Yellow Lanterns, wearing one ring on each finger of his right hand. Mongol assumed control over the Sinestro Corps, which he renamed the Mongol Corps after taking control of Warworld and making it the Corps' new homeworld base. Sinestro later confronted Mongol, however, and, using a failsafe that Sinestro built into each of the Yellow Lantern rings, defeated Mongol and retook control of the Corps. In post-Flashpoint continuity, Mongol was now Mongol the 1791st, and was revealed to be the descendant of a long line of rulers within a race of alien conquerors known as the War Zoon, inhabitants of the ancient and powerful War World Prime, which had been created by the Old Gods. After assuming control of War World Prime once again, dwarfing the other War Worlds, Mongul attempted to get revenge on Sinestro and retake control over his core of Yellow Lanterns. Though he nearly succeeded, Sinestro turned Mongul's hired mercenaries against him, and later Mongul was killed by his son, Mongul the 1792nd, who now rules over Warworld. The powers wise, Mongul possesses vast strength and durability natural to the War Zoon race, who live upon the harsh environment of Warworld. The crystal amulet embedded on his chest, passed down from the very first Mongol ruler, only increases his power and allows him to emit powerful energy blasts from his chest, eyes, or hands. Mongol also possesses an array of technological trinkets that allow him to teleport, shrink others into small energy cubes, and mentally control Warworld, a planet-sized weapon equipped with missiles, energy cannons, and war machines that can conquer and destroy other planets. Mongol is also a strategic and scientific genius, having created a genetically modified Black Mercy parasitic plant to induce paralysis by physically bringing about the host's worst nightmares. And that's Mongol. Why does his story seem like a ripoff of the movie Gladiator? Like, why is DC so unoriginal? Dude, I thought the same thing, but apparently Gladiator's a ripoff of the Mongol story. <laughs> it's crazy, right? Somebody better sue Universal Pictures, is all I'm saying. That's <laughs> also what I'm thinking. Although, who knows, next year, Universal may own Mongol, so they'd just be suing themselves. But uh, now that we've got their histories and abilities out of the way, let's speculate on how one of the 1000 simulated matches will go. The winner is determined by simulations, not this speculation, but it's fun to imagine how this fight could play out. Alfred Jarvis 9000, what are the rules of our speculation? Well, I should say there are no rules, other than the characters have no prior knowledge of the other going into the fight. All they are aware of starting out is that the other character is a threat that needs to be eliminated. For the speculation, the contestants will begin approximately 50 meters apart in a nondescript environment that will have no bearing on the match itself, as no environmental statistics are considered in my simulations. The contestants must earn victory on their own merit. All right, then, let's get into it. Mongol and Annihilus meet on the battlefield. Who goes first? I'm going to say that Annihilus goes first because he seems more 
maniacal than the more like brooding Mongol. So Annihilus starts off by blitzing Mongol, reaching him in less than a second and just flying into him and tackling him to the ground. Okay, except that Annihilus tackles nothing but air because Mongol teleports out of the way. Poof. And when Annihilus stops to look for Mongol, that's when Mongol reappears behind him and with like a single punch, just knocks Annihilus into the horizon to where Mongol teleports and is waiting for him. All right. Well, okay. So Annihilus, you know, he skids across the floor a few times and then lands at the feet of Mongol again, uh, looking up at him. But that's exactly where Annihilus wants him. Because from the ground, he's going to fire a blast of cosmic energy from his cosmic control rod right up at Mongol. And the blast is so massive, it sends Mongol literally into space, into the orbit of whatever planet they're fighting on. And Mongol can't fly, so he's like, whoa, (laughs) you know, spinning around the world. Uh, But Annihilus can fly, and he flies up to Mongol and just like lands this massive uppercut into Mongol's big ass target of a chin. (laughs) <laughs> well, I wouldn't say that Mongol can't fly. I think there's been some feats where it's shown that he can, but it's extremely rare. Mostly he's seen as like a more of a leaper like the Hulk. But uh, sure, yeah, he's in space right now. And, you know, he's definitely caught off guard. But as he's tumbling through space, that's when he summons War World into the planet's orbit, which beams both him and Annihilus to the planet's surface. So now this match is going to take place in War World's battle arena. Nice. But I'm going to say that if, like, Mongol can summon War World into this match, then Annihilus can summon his Annihilation Wave. Okay? Okay. That's only fair, right? So he's going to open up this portal into the negative zone using his cosmic control rod, and through it is going to come this entire fleet of insectivorid ships, and they just arrive like a plague of locusts, just blotting out the stars with how dense their numbers are. Okay, that's fine. You know, War World is going to be busy blasting all of these ships to smithereens. And meanwhile, Mongol, he's going to fire his own energy blast from his uh, chest crystal, which just sends Annihilus crashing into the edge of the arena. And War World citizens are like, Mongol, Mongol, Mongol. Yeah, and those chants quickly turn into shouts of, Oh my god, we're fucking dying! (laughs) When the Annihilation Wave just starts nuking the shit out of War World. Just everything around the battle arena and the whole planet is just getting blasted to bits. There's devastation everywhere. But, you know, Annihilus doesn't care because he's indestructible. And as the gladiatorial arena's floor opens up from being split from the destruction, Annihilus is going to rush up to Mongol, grab him, and then slam him through the planet's surface. Oh, you know who else doesn't care about what's happening around them? Mongol. Because those nukes that are coming from the Annihilation wave ships aren't doing shit besides revealing new layers of weaponry. Like, each Mongol ruler essentially created a new layer of weaponized surface to Warworld Prime. So we've got like almost 2,000 more layers to go here. (laughs) So as Annihilus slams Mongol onto the next surface, Mongol just kicks Annihilus like miles away, and Annihilus in turn gets slammed by a massive targeted missile that just obliterates Annihilus along with like the next three layers of Warworld surface, like leaving this giant crater. Oh yeah? Force field! Damn it! (laughs) <laughs> so in the center of this crater that Mongol just blasted in his own planet is Annihilus, surrounded and protected by this personal cosmic energy force field. Uh, it protected him from the blast, so he's fine. And he's going to fly up to join the Annihilation Wave ships, and he's going to board the greatest of their ships, which is called the Harvester of Sorrows. And that was a ship that the Annihilation Wave used to destroy planets, and it literally uses the planet's energy as fuel. So the Harvester ship is just going to send out this planet-sized energy blast that consumes Warworld with Mongol on it. I mean, like, maybe like a baby planet-sized energy blast. Like, Warworld no. Prime is pretty fucking huge. Dude, the Annihilation Wave has destroyed plenty of planets you know, of all sizes, some that were, like, multiple times the size of Earth, so... Dude, big whoop. Like, War World can destroy entire suns. So it meets this ship's energy blast with its own. And when the beams collide, it's going to generate this massive explosion that destroys not only the Harvester of Sorrows, but the entire Annihilation Wave. (laughs) 
And a Nihilus, obviously. Okay, this has to be like a massive explosion. If this explosion is big enough to destroy the entire Annihilation Wave, that explosion is also going to destroy Warworld too. Like, there's, there's no way around that. So, like, in the midst of space, there's all this debris from the planet and the ships, and there's bodies everywhere and devastation. But surviving it all in the center of it is Annihilus, the indestructible Annihilus, just floating in the middle of it all. Mongols vaporized. Marvel wins. I don't know what makes you think that Warworld would get annihilated by this. Like, it's a fucking tank planet. Yeah, and the Annihilation Wave is a big-ass armada. Okay, well, I mean, you're probably right that Mongol wouldn't survive a blast that could also destroy all of Warworld Prime, as ridiculous as that is. So, sure, Annihilus is floating out there, you know, feeling victorious. Except that the whole thing was a dream. What? When Mongol first teleported behind Annihilus at the beginning of this match, instead of punching him, he really just infected Annihilus with the Black Mercy parasitic plant, which paralyzed Annihilus and gave him this delusion of this epic battle in which he came out on top. But in reality, while Annihilus is just standing there grinning like an idiot, lost in thought, that's when Mongol is just going to reach down his giant ass mouth and tear his spine out. Except that that whole idea is stupid and I hate it. (laughs) I I honestly forgot entirely about the Black Mercy plant. But we'll leave the scenario there. Either one of two things happens depending on the results of this match. Either the most epic battle of all time happens where a whole planet and armada of ships is destroyed with Annihilus standing victorious through it all, or Mongol just made it all a dream with a parasitic plant and then rips out Annihilus' spine through his throat. That's the boring way. Mine is the cool way. Hopefully Annihilus wins this and that epic battle really happened. But let's go ahead and enter the character stats and run the simulations and find out which character is going to win. AJ9K, hit it. Inputting data, running calculations, processing results, simulations complete. So stats wise, the two characters were pretty even on a number of categories. You know, they're both extremely durable. They could both deal a ton of damage and they both have about equal range and intelligence. There were a number of differences, though. We said that Annihilus was faster just through the speed feats he has. Mongol is not quite as fast as Annihilus, seemingly, according to their actions in the comics. Annihilus is also more evasive than Mongol, considering that not only can he fly, but he also can produce force fields using his cosmic control rod. And it's not like Mongol doesn't move again. He's sort of like the Hulk in that regard, but he does sort of enjoy also tanking a lot of shots. Yeah, and plus he's got a big old head and that thing's not dodging anything. <laughs> Uh, We did say Mongol was stronger than Annihilus, definitely, for sure, as well as a better fighter. Annihilus is kind of just like this crazed maniac brawler guy, but Mongol actually has a significant amount of fight training and experience. Right, exactly. So considering all that, Jonathan, who is coming out on top in this match? It's got to be Mongol. Like, he's way stronger and, you know, he's just as durable it's it's got to be Mongol. This guy could take on Superman. He could take on Wonder Woman. There's no way in hell he can't take on fucking Annihilus. Just this little bug that can be squashed. Though it looks like Instagram both agrees and disagrees with me because it was a 50-50 split on who they thought would come out on top in this match. And that's pretty surprising because we got quite a number of votes for this one, like around 30 or 40 or something like that. Yeah. So the fact that it came out pretty even... Makes me think that this was seemingly a pretty even matchup. Yeah, it definitely looks like both characters have their share of fans. Let's find out if this was an even matchup by revealing the winner. AG9K, the results, please. Here you are, sir. All right, the winner between the cosmic villains of Mongol and Annihilus is Annihilus. But it was really close. Uh, These guys went tit for tat. Not quite even, but definitely measuring up to each other. Annihilus only won 504 matches out of 1,000. Holy shit! Barely squeaking over 50% at 50.4%, where Mongol won 496 matches at 49.6%. Holy shit, that is really close. These results have got to be the closest to what our Instagram followers thought it would be that we've ever done. 
maybe like it was interesting how the characters weren't very similar stats wise like they had a lot of differences and yet it still came out as close as a coin toss i'm I'm actually glad that it was close because both characters i think are really cool i think both deserved to win we should note that we did not factor in Warworld itself or Annihilus's army into these stat figures. Right, because the characters have to win on their own merits. That being said, Warworld is the ultimate weapon, and there's no reason to say why Mongol wouldn't take advantage of using it. Same for Annihilus with his Annihilation Wave, especially against a villain as powerful as Mongol. These guys both have resources. They may as well use them. You know, I think it makes for a better match that way. Very true. But that does it for this duel. Let us know what you thought about the results by writing to us at dynamicduelpodcast at gmail.com or by visiting us on Instagram or X. You can find links to all of our accounts by checking out our show notes or visiting our website at dynamicduel.com. And on our site, you could also find a link to our Patreon page where you could join our Dynamic 2 tier and chat with us and fellow listeners. Our Fantastic 4 tier, which gets you bonus content each month our X-Force tier that makes you an executive producer of this podcast, or our newest tier that lets you join our Dynamite Podcast Network. If you can't join Patreon, you can still support the show by signing up for our e-newsletter, also at dynamicduel.com, so you'll never miss an episode. Please don't forget to also visit our website in order to leave donations for Pop Culture Classroom, which will get you a digital poster of our upcoming Charity Duel episode in December, Alfred Pennyworth versus Edwin Jarvis. Yeah, support a great cause, guys, and let's show them that Dynamic Duel fans care. Next week is going to be a review episode. We're going to review the upcoming Marvel Studios movie, The Marvels. Jonathan, do you have any predictions for that one? Yeah, I think it's going to (laughs) suck. All right. Well, Jonathan has low expectations, which means that he's going to be pleasantly surprised with the quality of the film. We'll see. And probably love it. All right. But that does it for this episode. We want to give a big thanks to our executive producers, Ken Johnson, John Starosky, Zachary Hepburn, Dustin Belcom, Miggy Mathankian, Brandon Estergaard, Nathaniel Wagner, Levi Yaton, Nick Abanto, Austin Wisolowski, AJ Dunkerley, Scott Camacho, Adam Spees, and Andrew Schunk for helping make this podcast possible. We'll talk to you guys next week. Up, up, and away. True believers. Get in the zone. Negative zone.